bring in our legal analyst, still with us, criminal defense attorney Michael Bixon, and joining the discussion, criminal defense attorney Mark Bagno. Mark, welcome to the discussion. I'll go to you first. Uh, what's your take on Judge Cahill making this decision? Uh, you know, as Chanley said, it was a sua sponte, meaning that none of the other parties said, hey, we want to move this trial. The judge said we should move this thing. Um, how common is that and what's your take on that decision to put more space in between the Chauvin verdict and then the trial of the other three officers? Um, morning, Ted. Thanks for having me on. Um, I, I think that it makes sense on two levels that the judge, um, Sue Esponte, decided to push that trial. Um, first, on a fairness level, um, I, I do think that it makes sense to push it, given that there has been so much publicity. Um, you know, you, you don't want the arguments that we're going to see on appeal for Mr. Chauvin, that there was a tainted jury pool. And so you want to kind of diffuse that as much as you can. But also, I mean, bear in mind that we're coming out of COVID. Uh, courts all over the country are really backed up. And this judge is going to want to move cases that aren't these cases. And, you know, obviously the, this court has been dealing with this case for quite some time, is now dealing with post-trial stuff. Keying up this trial with these three defendants is going to shut down that courtroom for another several months. And so, you know, I think the judge also has an interest in pushing in just in terms of judicial efficiency to be able to move other cases. Hmm, interesting. The other um, issue brought up at yesterday's hearing was from Thomas Lane's uh, attorney, um, Earl Gray, and um, they want 30 years of incident reports uh, produced to basically make the argument that nobody ever has ever um, been charged with not um, aiding somebody else in this Minneapolis Police Department. Um, and, and they're going to use, they want to use, you see um, there that the judge is taking it under advisement. Um, but, Michael, they, they want to use this as a, like, look at this. You can't expect a guy who's been on the job for four days to have done something that's never been done before in the history of this police department. Um, what's your take on that request? It does seem a bit burdensome, um, but uh, I see where they're going. I mean, it's definitely burdensome. 30 years of records. It's going to take them quite a while to go through. I don't know if the judges can allow it to go that far. I can definitely see at least a couple years, five years, maybe even 10 years. Um, I do think that it's important for the defense, and I do think that it could be a part of their case. But, you know, a judge is going to weigh the interest of both parties, and, and I do think that it might be a stretch to go back as far as, like, 30 years. Mark, the defense um, or the, the, the federal prosecutors are also uh, in line here now, and, and Judge Cahill wants the feds to go first in this case. If... One would think if the state is saying we need more space in between the Chauvin verdict and our state case, well, doesn't that also work for the federal case? You need the same amount of space, one would think, for the next case to start, whether it's in federal court or state court. It doesn't matter. Would we be um, expected to anticipate a delay no matter what? That This August 23rd that was set for the state case, it's not as if the federal case is going to go August 23rd that should be pushed back as well, when one would think. I mean, I, I think you're right, Ted. I, I think that, yeah, the same factors will be in play in terms of just general fairness and looking at the overall, you know, media landscape. But also, I mean, we don't have a trial date in the federal court. You know, federal courts like state courts are still getting back up and running, especially when it comes to jury trials. And so I, I think that for both, you know, the reasons of just kind of efficiency and economy and also fairness, we're going to see that federal trial years out. Two Towns attorney also made a motion yesterday uh, in court. And um, this was a, a little bit a different motion than we saw from Thomas Lane, much different. And this one, he, he they want that um, all the prosecutors to come in and they want to ferret out a leak, specifically uh, several leaks. But the one that they're really concerned about is the deal that was made between the state and Derek Chauvin, basically 10 years, if you do 10 years, plead guilty to third, um, we'll let it go. Bill Barr at the time, William Barr said, no, we're not gonna allow that. Um, and, and they wanna bring in prosecutors to see where this leak came from, Michael. That seems a bit, maybe not burdensome, but odd and, and just uh, unconventional, but Judge Cahill is open to the idea, possibly just those prosecutors submitting briefs, not being cross-examined. What's your take? on that it is very unusual and the prosecution is going to, have to be very very careful about signing either an affidavit or making any testimony because if the defense is able to show any evidence at all that this leak did come from not just their office but 
one of the actual prosecutors. I, I mean, it, it could ruin the entire trial if it shows some type of, you know, prosecutorial misconduct to that level. Do you think and there's think a, some sort of inside info? Do, show it. do you think that they must know something, that somebody tipped them, that to think that this did come from a prosecutor? Otherwise, why file this? It's tough to say. I mean, they could just be putting pressure on the prosecutors. It's entirely possible they didn't come from them at all. But to have something now signed, and if you find something out later, then you're obviously you're put in a very good position. I mean, if they get the prosecutors to sign that affidavit, it doesn't hurt them at all, even if it shows that you know they couldn't find anything later on. But if they do find something later on, yeah, it's absolutely going to be crucial to their case. Yeah, absolutely. All right, turning to South Georgia now, where a two-day pretrial motion hearing wrapped up late yesterday, setting the stage for the trial of three men facing felony murder for the death of Ahmad Arbery. The defendants, Travis McMichael, his father, Gregory McMichael, and their neighbor, William Roddy Bryan, are all facing felony murder charges for chasing down and killing Ahmad Arbery last February. During these past two days of hearings, both sides battled over a vast amount of evidence that could, could come up at trial, including more than 1,500 jail calls, as well as the personal medical records of the victim. Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae was there for it all and has more from the Glynn County Courthouse. Ted, the culmination of this two-day motions hearing marks one of the last times that these parties are going to be together here at the Glynn County Courthouse before we start hearing the words all rise for the jury. You know, that trial date is set for October 18th, and these proceedings are getting closer and closer in terms of what is legally necessary and what they're going to be looking at uh, before that trial. You could see on the faces of the family of Ahmad Arbery just how draining the hearing has been and the things that they've had to hear about Arbery while they are sitting in this proceeding. The mother of Ahmad Arbery saying that she is just ready for this to be over, ready to get justice for her son, looking ahead to that October date. But in this hearing, there are still motions that the judge is taking under advisement. So we are going to be paying attention to the docket on what he is going to order on those, the most substantial of those being a motion to disqualify the prosecutor in this case, another motion to exclude all jail calls and a motion in limine by the state to limit any character evidence of the victim coming in at trial. And one of the ones that we heard the most arguments on on Thursday had to do with the mental health records of Arbery from back in 2018 that the defense is alleging would be relevant to this case. We heard those dueling arguments from both the state and defense on why it should or should not come in front of a jury. Judge Walmsley ultimately saying that he wants more information from these parties, telling them to submit briefs, first the defense in the next 20 days, and then the state's response. He wants them to highlight which records they plan to use and how they are relevant under the law. He also wants to set one more hearing date here in Glen County before that jury selection starts in October. Ted. All right, Julie Janae, thank you. Next week, we're expecting to be in California for the continuation of the Robert Durst murder trial. However, that may change. Court TV has confirmed that Durst's defense team filed a motion late yesterday asking for an indefinite delay due to a number of health problems they say Durst is battling, including bladder cancer. The trial was put on hold last March because of COVID. After six days of testimony, Durst, who's now 78 years old, it's facing a murder charge for allegedly killing his friend Susan Berman back in the year 2000. A hearing is scheduled Monday in Los Angeles, where we'll likely find out if that delay will be granted by the judge. Let's bring back our legal analyst still with us, of course, criminal defense attorney Michael Bixson and Mark Begno as well. Mark, what's the odds of the judge after all of this saying, all right, He's got some health issues. Well, that's pretty apparent if you've seen Robert Durst. Um, and, and we should hold off and, and not go to trial here. The defense also, of course, wants him let out on bond during this period of time so he can convalesce in the privacy of his own home. Um, this, uh, this doesn't seem like it has a lot going for it. But on the other hand, if he has bladder cancer and he is expected to testify, um, he can't really help out in his own defense, Kenny. Yeah, that, that's a fair point, Ted. Um, I, realistically, I, I think it's unlikely that the judge would grant this. Um, you know, it's an old case. The judge is going to want to move it. 
Um, it, it's pretty normal to see a defendant asking for um, a trial to be moved, and it's pretty normal for a defendant who has any health issues to be asking for, for those reasons. I Usually you see that fall on deaf ears with judges. It could be that this judge is particularly sympathetic, or maybe this judge just doesn't want to bog down his courtroom with this trial. And if this judge were to grant the motion, I would guess it's just because he wants to move everything that's been building up during COVID. But um, if, if I'm uh, gambling on it, I'm, I'm thinking this trial is going to go. Michael, what's your take? I do think there's actually a possibility that the judge might delay it. In a case of this magnitude, you're going to want to make sure that there's no issues going forward. And if he does take the stand, you're going to want to make sure that something as serious as a diagnosis like this isn't going to affect that, or you don't want to be halfway through the trial, and then this medical issue flares up, and he's not able to assess, assist his defense team. So I do think there is a chance. Mm -hmm. and, and likely the judge may be, may be asking for um, a doctor to come and testify to make sure of the limitations that maybe um, this defendant faces. Who knows? We'll have to see, but we'll find out on Monday morning. We'll uh, be there for that uh, pretrial hearing when the judge is expected to make a ruling from the bench. Robert Durst, was, it was promised to the jury that he would take the stand in his own defense. Coming up, other defendants that decided to testify in their own defense, including this woman, Catherine McBanawa. She was accused in the murder of a Florida state law professor. They said she set it all up. She said she didn't. Hear what she told the jury after the break.